tonight, a machine that thinks like a person. It's the stuff that dreams and nightmares are made of. I confidently expect that within a matter of 10 or 15 years, something will emerge from the laboratories which is not too far from the robot of science fiction fame. The quest to build an artificial intelligence, the thinking machine, next on The Machine That Changed the World. Funding is made possible by Unisys, meeting the mission-critical information systems needs of business and government worldwide. At Unisys, we make it happen. And by the 90,000 members of the ACM, computer professionals advancing human capabilities through information technology. And the National Science Foundation. different from a computer. What else do we it's have? It's not human. That's right. It's it's human. Human. Wait, 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 wait. It's not human. It's not human. It's human. But a computer isn't human. That's what That's I said. Right. People don't have buttons and a computer does. You have buttons on your shirt. Uh. <laughs> Can the computer think? Yeah. No. How many people think the computer can... Think? The issues this class of kindergartners are struggling with have exercised some of the world's smartest minds during the 40-year history of the computer. For computers are not like other machines. Their ability to manipulate concepts gives them a mind-like quality. And from the very beginning, some people saw them not as a calculating device or a mental aid, but a thinking machine. The Thinking Machine. Hello again. With me tonight is Professor Jerome B. Wiesner, director of the Research Laboratory of Electronics at MIT. Dr. Wiesner, what really worries me today is what's going to happen to us if machines can think. And what interests me specifically is can they? Well, that's a very hard question to answer. If you'd asked me that question just a few years ago, I'd have said it was very far-fetched. And today, I just have to admit, I don't really know. I suspect if you come back in four or five years, I'll say, sure, they really do think. Well, if you're confused, Doctor, how do you think I feel? We're just really beginning to understand the capabilities of the computers. I've got some film to illustrate this point, which I think will amaze you. That man isn't playing checkers against a computer, is he? Sure, and it plays pretty well. Now, which color While most computer scientists saw it as a mere number cruncher, a small group thought that the digital computer had a much grander destiny. Being a general purpose machine, it could be programmed to do things which in humans require intelligence, play games like checkers and chess, and solve brain teasers. Let's see what it's turning up. The field became known as artificial intelligence. And no one institution would be linked with its fortunes like the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. In 1958, two young mathematicians, Marvin Minsky and John McCarthy, set up a department to explore this exciting new intellectual frontier. They attracted a series of brilliant students. One of the first, Jim Slagle got the idea of programming the computer to solve problems in freshman calculus. Our problem boils down to integrating uh, the, a complex function, which is uh, at least it's most easily done in complex notation. Jim Slagle uh, decided to write a program which would try to solve the kinds of problems that uh, MIT students do in the first year calculus mathematics. And the problem was doing what we call symbolic integrals. 
He wrote a program which consisted of more or less a hundred kinds of rules or suggestions. The machine would try various ones and then uh, it would use the special set of rules. I called them rules of fear. If, if the thing got too complicated, it would say, that's no good, it's too complicated. But if it seemed to be getting simpler, it would follow it further. Well, the amazing thing, and this was 1960, just uh, a couple of years after we started, uh, the thing got an A on the MIT exam, and it was frightening. Uh, it was doing as well as the average student, or maybe slightly better. These first small exercises in artificial intelligence had turned out so well that hopes for the future were very high indeed. They were delirious that in 10 years they had gone from machines that moved bits around to machines that actually proved logic and played games and everyone was amazed that these things which what they thought were just number crunchers could be minds, had intelligence. Thinking intelligent thoughts is a mysterious activity. While the brain, the hardware which enables us to think, is physical, philosophers have tended to locate our mental activities in a different abstract realm that we call the mind. Let's close our eyes and imagine that we are on the moon. Close your eyes now. Keep your eyes closed. Now imagine you're not on this planet Earth, but at a school on the moon. Okay. Now all of you live on the moon, and you live in moon houses, and there... Moon the mind is a place where we can hold and manipulate ideas as if they were real things. Are we all on the moon now? Yeah. Living in moon houses? Yeah. Hmm? Getting ready to go to the moon Montessori school? Yeah. yeah. What kind of a house would you live in there? Um, 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 I, I, know, know, I know what is a white house and, 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 and a red window. No window there. What clothes do you wear there? The ideas can be about real things we know about the world from our senses, but they can also be completely imaginary, dealing with worlds we have never seen. A computer, too, can conjure up worlds both real and imaginary. The pioneers of artificial intelligence reasoned that if a brain can also be a mind, then so can a computer. The fact that the hardware of the brain with its neurons was completely different from the computer with its vacuum tubes was irrelevant. It was the thoughts that they manipulated which were important. The pioneers in the field of artificial intelligence had little interest in the question of how the brain was actually constructed. That is, they viewed and continue to view the mind as something different from the brain. The mind is a symbolic processing entity. The brain is, so to speak, the hardware on which the mind runs. Mind is analogized to software. Brain is analogized to hardware. Just as software runs on the hardware of a computer, the mind is what, so to speak, runs on the, on the wetware of a brain. Blindly copying nature's way of doing things wasn't always a good idea. Attempts at artificial flight based on the way birds fly had been a disaster. They had this interesting analogy that just like when you made planes, you didn't have to make them with flapping wings. The biology didn't make any difference. We just bypassed biology and evolution and made planes with motors and we made rockets. And if we'd spent our time trying to make things that flap their wings like people did in the early days, we wouldn't have ever had anything that flies. So it doesn't matter at all how the brain makes intelligence. We don't have to model the brain any more than you have to make something that flaps its wings in order to make something that flies. In the early 1960s, Hubert Dreyfus was a young philosopher working at MIT, one of the few representatives of the humanities in an institution which lives and breathes science. Students of his who were immersed in the exciting new frontier of artificial intelligence began trying to convince him that for philosophy, the writing was on the wall. Students would come into my courses on Heidegger and Wittgenstein and say, 
that you philosophers have uh, had your 2,000 years and you haven't come up with much, but we are beginning to, in fact, we've already practically finished understanding um, uh, perception and particularly intelligence, uh, reasoning and so forth. And uh, in effect, uh, the ball has passed to us. And I was amazed. I didn't, I had heard nothing about that. Can machines really think? Even the scientists argue that one. I'm convinced that machines can and will think. I don't mean that machines will behave like men. I don't think for a very long time we're going to have a difficult problem distinguishing a man from a robot. And I don't think my daughter will ever marry a computer. But I think the computers will be doing the things that men do when we say they're thinking. I'm convinced that machines can and will think in our lifetime. I confidently expect that within a matter of 10 or 15 years, something will emerge from the laboratories which is not too far from the robot of science fiction fame. Things, however, were to turn out rather differently. The MIT scientists wanted their computer mind to interact with the world, so they built a gripper for a hand and a TV camera for an eye. The task they set it, to stack blocks, was on the face of it, child's play. But it turned out to be more difficult than anyone could have imagined. It's easy enough to get a picture into a computer. The trouble is that a, a block or a box is different. You move it this way, it's a different shape. And so uh, you almost never see the same thing twice. Sometimes uh, there's shadows on it. Sometimes it's darker or lighter. Different boxes have different surfaces. Sometimes there are things written on it. So that even though uh, to you or me or a child, the idea of a, seeing a block seems simple, it's actually very, very complicated. But beyond the problem of recognizing blocks, the program had some rather strange ideas about what happened to blocks when you let them go. Uh, for example, we asked the robot to build a tower of blocks. And uh, guess what it did? It started with the top block, put it there in space and let it go, because the machine didn't know that uh, if you let go of something, it will fall. It didn't know about gravity, and it didn't know about the kinds of things that uh, every uh, two-year-old child knows. So it took several years to do that. Across the Atlantic, things weren't going any faster. At the University of Edinburgh, another ambitious vision project was underway. This documentary from 1971 showed just how intractable some of the problems were. Freddy is a computer and his world consists only of this round board and the objects on it. We immediately see this as a cup. Now the computer tries. After the first phase of processing, we have something which looks like this. The computer has sorted out the four major regions. Top of the cup, body of the cup, hole in the handle, and this irregular region, which is the shadow. After painstakingly working out where the object ends and the background begins, the computer is ready to name what it is looking at. On the teletype, you can see the results coming out. But it took 10 minutes. A two-year-old child would recognize it immediately. The problems of moving and seeing at the same time were even more taxing. At Stanford in the early 70s, Hans Moravec bravely tried to get his cart, a wagon connected to a massive computing engine, to cross a space avoiding objects in its path. Each flash represented 15 minutes of thinking time, which tied up the department's computers. So each meter of travel of the robot was accompanied by 15 minutes of computation, and the crossing of a large 30-meter room took five hours. Uh, a four-year-old is already equipped with uh, wonderful circuitry to look at the world and detect the presence of objects and to uh, note their, the uh, imminent collisions and to avoid them. So a four-year-old can toddle across a room with apparent effortlessness. The Stanford cart used a hierarchy of programs which were anything but effortless. The computational problems of vision were so immense and required such different kinds of computing engines than those available that many researchers decided to avoid the area and concentrate instead on a purer form of intelligence, 
a truly disembodied mind, one that didn't need eyes or hands. In 1950, the British computer pioneer Alan Turing had speculated that one day machines would think. He proposed a test, the Turing test, which a machine would have to pass before it could be considered truly intelligent. Imagine you were sitting in a room communicating via a screen with an entity somewhere else. It may be a person or a computer program. By question and answer, you have to determine whether you are talking to a human or a machine. This entity doesn't need eyes or limbs. In principle, it doesn't need a body at all. All it has to do to beat the challenge is to use language intelligently. One of the first computer programs which sought to use language convincingly in this way was Joseph Weizenbaum's program, ELIZA. Here is a conversation between a computer, the capital letters, and a person. How do you do? Please tell me your problem. Women are all alike. In what way? They are always bugging us about something or other. Can you think of a specific example? Although it seems to understand the words, it is in fact based on a series of tricks. Eliza understands nothing about the meaning behind the words. Often, Eliza just turns a reply into another question. Well, my girlfriend made me come here. Your girlfriend made you come here? But it is geared to look for important words, like mother, father, or dream. Then it will respond more aggressively. She and my mother value therapy. Tell me more about your family. And once you realize this, it can be easily fooled. My opinion is that necessity is the mother of invention. Tell me more about your family. Such a program could not possibly pass the Turing test and could not be said to use language intelligently. Eliza was a light-hearted foray into a field which was full of difficulty, for remarkably, it would turn out that the human ability to understand spoken or written sentences was vastly more complex than solving calculus problems. Even if you take a, a simple everyday sentence like, um, Mary saw the bicycle in the store window, she wanted it. It might refer to the bicycle, the store window, the store, and which it refers to depends not so much on English as on your knowledge of what people want and don't want. Um, if I had said, um, she saw the bicycle through the store window, um, she looked at it longingly and pressed her nose up against it. That second it probably refers to the store window and not the bicycle. Well, now you have to bring in knowledge of human anatomy and the fact that people um, um, emotionally like to be near things that they want, even if they can't have them and so forth. They hadn't reckoned with ambiguity when they set out to use computers to translate languages. A $500,000 supercalculator, most versatile electronic brain known, translates Russian into English. Instead of mathematical wizardry, a sentence in Russian is to be fed... One of the first non-numerical applications of computers, it was hyped as the solution to the Cold War obsession of keeping tabs on what the Russians were doing. Claims were made that the computer would replace most human translators. At present, of course, you're just in the experimental stage. When you go in for full-scale production, what will the capacity be? We should be able to do about, with a modern commercial computer, uh, about one to two million words uh, an hour. And this will be quite an adequate speed to cope with the whole output of the Soviet Union in just a few hours computer time a week. When do you hope to be able to achieve the speed? If our experiments go well, then perhaps within uh, five years or so. And finally, Mr. McDaniel, does this mean the end of human translators? I would say yes for uh, translators of scientific and technical material, but as regards poetry and novels, no, I don't think we'll ever replace the translators of that type of material. Mr. McDaniel, thank you very much.
But despite the hype, it ran into deep trouble. This straightforward Russian passage poses no trouble for a human translator. In the present paper, we propose using matrix Boolean algebra and we describe some results which we have already obtained in this way. But when it was given to a computer, this was all it could come up with. In a two-for-one present genuine article item clause, to be offered to be proposed to be suggest for investigation, research, analysis, exploration paper essay, such so a sort of sort kind family transgender, utilized to take advantage of matrix Boolean algebra and N to be described row series, result gotten in that into two-for-one N, this direction trend order permit. Humans all over the world, even though they have never met, even though they have different languages and traditions, share a vast amount of common knowledge. Knowledge of what human beings are and what they strive for, their goals and beliefs, their sensitivities and fears. Before they could translate or understand languages, computers would have to know these things, as people do. We are so good at using and understanding language that before computers came along, we never realized just how difficult the task was. Language is just full of ambiguity. What words mean depend on their context. Imagine the problems an alien from outer space would have understanding these newspaper headlines. What kind of pattern are the police looking for? Is this about breakfast food or Britain's Labour Party? What we began to see is that the things that people think are hard are actually rather easy, and the things that people think are easy are very hard. Uh, we could do the calculus with just a few hundred pieces of program, but to learn language, to recognize faces, to walk, and to put your clothes on and do the kinds of things we expect every child to do, we still can't do with the robots of, and the AIs of 1990. Once so promising, the fortunes of artificial intelligence now looked bleak indeed. In 1972, Hubert Dreyfus wrote a history cataloging the failures of AI called What Computers Can't Do. The same year in Britain, funding for projects like Freddy was cut off following a scathing report of AI's progress by Sir James Lighthill. In no part of the field have the discoveries made produced the major impact that was promised. I'm going to describe very briefly... Minsky and his colleagues didn't give up. They set about working on machine learning and on how to represent knowledge in computers so that computers could use that knowledge to resolve ambiguity in language. One project did succeed. Terry Winograd's program, Schlerdlu, could use English intelligently, but there was a catch. The only subject you could discuss was a micro-world of simulated blocks. Find the block which is taller than the one you're holding and put it into the box. In this case, it needs to do a whole set of things, one of which is figure out what is meant by words like one and it. We use those in normal everyday language in a way which has to be interpreted by looking at the context in which they appear. In this case, it types back out, by it, I assume you mean a block which is taller than the one I am holding, which is only one of several possible things I could have meant. And it needed to use a set of rules of thumb about how people use words like that in order to decide, in this case, which one I intended. Despite Winograd's achievements, people outside AI circles were not impressed. Some predicted that artificial intelligence was doomed. But AI would not die out. In the dark years ahead, this man, Edward Feigenbaum, would somewhat restore AI's fortune. He realized that while micro-worlds might not be very large, they might be large enough to be useful. He reasoned that the intelligence displayed by experts, scientists, doctors, specialists, might be as easy to capture, if not easier, than a world of simulated blocks. Feigenbaum started with the expertise chemists use when reading a mass spectrograph trace like this and interpreting it as a three-dimensional structure like this. 
Feigenbaum and his colleagues captured the rules in a system called Dendrol. Now a computer program was expert in a small area of chemistry. Other so-called expert systems followed, like this one, which simulated how geologists find mineral deposits. All kinds of areas of medicine and science where the knowledge used was deep but very narrow succumbed to Feigenbaum's approach. Paradoxically, these admired specialties were easier for the computer to simulate. There was much less ambiguity, and they were not very large. When you actually codify this knowledge and put it to work, it turns out that you can achieve expert behavior in useful but narrow areas with a few hundred pieces of knowledge, maybe a few thousand pieces of knowledge. Experts were often shocked and startled to find out that in the end it amounted to a few hundred rules. Is that all I learned? Is that what I'm doing every day? I'm really exercising just a few hundred rules. All of me that relates to this task can be canned in a few hundred rules. But where a human expert knows many things outside his specialty, the same is not true of an expert system. Outside their field of knowledge, they are hopeless. So you get a blood disease analysis program. It's brilliant at deciding which blood disease the patient has on the basis of a lot of objective tests like the sugar in the blood presumably and the wet red cells and the white cells and a lot of more complicated things it will tell you what kind of say meningitis that is and it will tell you with more reliability than your family doctor terrific but if you ask it what is a germ uh, doesn't have the slightest idea or what is a patient or do people prefer to live or die then it breaks down that's the brittleness. There was an expert system um, which had to approve or not approve automobile loans. And it granted a loan to someone who put down that they had 20 years of experience on the same job, even though they also put down that they were only 19 years old. Um, a, um, another situation like that of brittleness um, that I, I saw firsthand, a um, system that was done in France for skin disease diagnosis. As a kind of joke, we told it about my 1980 Chevy. And it asked questions like, are there spots on the body? And we said, yes. What color spots, reddish brown? How old is the patient, you know, 10 years old? And it eventually said, the child has measles. The brittleness of expert systems has been likened to the fascinating condition of idiosavantism. David is an idiosavant, a human being brilliantly gifted in one small area, but backward in every other sense. What was the 17th of December, 1974? Uh, it was a, a Tuesday. The 10th of June, 1917. Uh, 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 it was a, a, a Sunday. The 1st of March, 2044. Uh, 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 it was a, a, a Tuesday. There aren't any calendars that far ahead, but it's again absolutely correct. Can you tell me what eight add on seven is? If you take eight and add seven to it. Eight and seven is fourteen. A test. Okay, it's not, you don't think it's fifteen. But outside this area, he is unable to function as a fully competent member of the world. David can't even add up properly. A deep but narrow mind will always break when it meets new situations. General human intelligence somehow creates a broad model of the world, enabling us to cope with all kinds of situations. To capture this in a computer program, we have to study not experts with their deep and narrow knowledge, but children who excel in knowledge which is broad and shallow. And zzz, I'm a big fat bee. Naughty couldn't stop her giggles. It's not me, Mom, she said. It's Ned. Language researchers were hard at work trying to get computers to follow simple stories, as children do. They discovered the problem wasn't what the story said. It was the huge number of things it left unsaid, because they were too obvious to be worth saying. Typical of the kinds of stories which researchers tackled in the early 1970s was this one. It was Jack's birthday. Jane and Janet were going to Jack's. Let's give him a kite, said Jane. 
No, he already has one, said Janet. He'll make you take it back. Could the computer understand this story and answer questions on its meaning? Although it seems easy, it presupposes a vast amount of knowledge. We assume they are going to a birthday party, but it doesn't actually say that. You notice that in that story, it's not clear that they're going to a birthday party. It was just, they were, it was Jack and they were going to Jack's. It isn't clear why they were buying a kite. It doesn't say anything about birthday presents and it doesn't say that you bring birthday presents and it doesn't say the kite was a birthday present. But they thought they had an answer to that. The answer was supposed to be build it into a birthday party frame. The thing after micro worlds, which looked promising, was scripts and frames. Then it, the idea was there is a stereotypical birthday party and a child has a birthday, then the child has a party, and then people come to the party and they bring gifts and so forth. So even though the story doesn't mention kites, the computer would fill in presents and kites. Since we judge words by their context, why not give the computer a context by building frames or scripts for the situations it might meet? A birthday party frame would contain all the things which usually happened at birthday parties. Once the computer had identified the frame, it could fill in the missing knowledge. But things were not to be so straightforward. The problem surfaced in a funny way. The idea that he already has one, he'll make you take it back. The challenge was, and I think it's unanswered to this day, here's a new bit of information. The information that if you, in our culture, sadly children learn, if you get a new one, just like the old one, you have to take the new one back, not the old one. And the question for them was, where are we gonna store that information? It doesn't belong in the birthday party frame. It doesn't belong in the department store frame. It's general background knowledge. The horrible thing, general background knowledge reared its head. And then when I heard it, as I usually did, I saw worse things. It occurred to me that the principle, if you have one, you don't want another one just like it, is not much of a strict rule. It doesn't apply to dollar bills. It probably doesn't apply to marbles or cookies. So the principle has got to be something like, well, everything else being equal. If you got one, you don't want another one just like it. But of course, in the everything else being equal is the whole common sense knowledge problem again, because what is everything else and how equal does it have to be? I mean, if it's a cookie is that big, maybe one is enough. But then if you're a cookie monster, probably one isn't enough. And all of the knowledge we have about cookies and appetites and cookie monsters and so forth comes in to understand just a simple birthday party story. And so that looked bad. The dream which had started out so well with checkers, chess, and calculus, and which had progressed through micro worlds and expert worlds, to representing knowledge in scripts and frames, had finally foundered on the common sense knowledge problem. Knowledge that is so intuitive we are hardly aware of it. Common sense knowledge is the knowledge that everybody shares. Everyone knows that if you hold something and release your grip, it falls. They don't know about gravity, but they know that this is common sense. There's no person uh, that you can communicate with who doesn't know the same things you do about space and time and social relations and uh, geometry and language and, and whatnot. Uh, how large is this database that we all share? I suspect it's about 10 million items or units, whatever units are. The secret of intelligence was common sense. The enormous number of things which we all know to be true, so much so that we are able to communicate effectively without even mentioning them. Could such vast quantities of knowledge possibly be acquired by machines? We learn these millions of things as children growing up. Could machines learn like people? Scientists had long been interested in machine learning but computers made very bad students because they started out from such a low level. Learning has the property that we learn at the fringe of what we already know. We learn that this new thing is similar to something we know already, and here's the difference. So the more you know, the more and more quickly you can learn. But the trouble is that we start our learning programs off with next to nothing, so they don't, very, they don't have a very big fringe, so they can't really learn very much very quickly. But it wasn't hopeless there was a way forward, albeit a rather audacious one. Lennett believed the only hope was to painstakingly feed the computer the millions of things it needed to know, 
so that it would be able to understand language and learn by itself. In 1984, he set up a project in Texas to do just this. Because it was likened to a vast encyclopedia project, it became known as Psych. The task was, however, not to make an encyclopedia, but to input the kind of knowledge which is not in encyclopedias because it is too obvious to include. For example, Psyche would have to know some things no encyclopedia would dream of mentioning about Abraham Lincoln. The Psych Project was the ultimate test of AI. If it was possible to build an artificial mind, this apparently was the only way to do it. Before a computer could understand language, before it could learn, it had to be given millions of pieces of common sense. But critics said Lennett's ambitious 10-year project would never work because knowledge alone was not enough. Real common sense, they argued, depended on having something no computer possessed, a human body. I'm my whole thing. Common sense knowledge, to a large extent, doesn't consist of facts. Not a hundred thousand, that's sure, but not a million either. No number of facts. A lot of what we know is not factual knowledge at all. It's skills. Anybody who has children must be struck by the number of years they can spend playing around with blocks, playing around with sand, even just playing around with water, just splashing it around, sopping it up, pouring it, splashing it, seems endlessly fascinating to children. And one might wonder, what are they doing? Why aren't they getting bored? How does this have any value? Well, I would say they're, they're acquiring the 50,000 water slushing cases that they need for pouring and drinking and spilling and carrying water. And they've got their 50,000 cases of how solids bump in, a scrape, stack on, fall off. And common sense knowledge would, in this story, that I believe, consist in this huge number of special cases which aren't remembered as a bunch of cases, but which have tuned the neurons so that when something similar to one of these cases comes in, an appropriate action or expectation comes out, and that's, that's what underlies common sense knowledge. Most people acquire the common sense knowledge they need to make sense of the world growing up as children, experiencing life in all its richness through the senses. But is this the only way to get it? There are people who never experience much of the world at all, and yet acquire and use language with common sense. In Oliver Sacks' collection of strange neurological cases, the man who mistook his wife for a hat, he wrote of a patient, Madeline. Born blind and unable to move her limbs, practically everything she knew about the world was told to her or read to her. And yet, Sachs records, she could use language with common sense. All my reading has been done for me. I can't read Braille, not a single word. I can't do anything with my hands. They're completely useless. If Madeline succeeded where computers have so far failed, it wasn't because she experienced what the words meant. The limited experience she did have was processed with an organ far more complex than any computer, her brain. The pioneers of AI had argued that they didn't need to know the way the brain worked any more than the first aviators needed to build planes with flapping wings. But some critics had never accepted this analogy, arguing that when it came to thinking, the only way to do it was nature's way. Perhaps to build an artificial mind, you had first to build an artificial brain. The human brain is not like a computer. It is made from billions of neurons connected together in thousands of ways. Experiences which come in through the senses trigger electrical signals to pass between the neurons. Patterns and regularities perceived by the senses are therefore remembered as similar patterns of neural discharges. The brain is awesomely complex. 
But from the early 1950s, some scientists pursued the idea of building an artificial brain to try to imitate how the brain's network of neurons learned. In the brain, experiences are recorded as the strengths of the connections between neurons. A new experience coming in through the senses changes the strengths of the connections. The pattern is then subsequently remembered. Other experiences set up other patterns. In the 1950s and 60s, scientists built a few working perceptrons, as these artificial brains were called. He's using it to explore the mysterious problem of how the brain learns. This perceptron is being trained to recognize the difference between males and females. It is something that all of us can do easily, but few of us can explain how. To get a computer to do this would involve working out many complex rules about faces and writing a computer program. But this perceptron was simply given lots and lots of examples, including some with unusual hairstyles. But when it comes to a beetle, the computer looks at facial features and hair outline and takes longer to learn what it's told by Dr. Taylor. Andrew Cruikshank's wig also causes a little heart searching. After training on lots of examples, it's given new faces it has never seen and is able to successfully distinguish male from female. It has learned. While promising, this approach to machine intelligence virtually died out. But in the late 70s, as AI's problems seemed insurmountable, it underwent a revival. The modern perceptrons are called neural networks, and the people who build them are a growing movement called connectionists. Neural networks model the brain, not the mind. They are small learning machines. And at universities all over the world, connectionists are seeing how much they can get their neural networks to learn. This vehicle is being driven by a neural network. The network hasn't been programmed. It has learned by itself how to keep the vehicle on the road. OK, very good. I won't try and go any faster. Earlier, we trained the network to uh, imitate a person driving, having the network watch the person as the person drove along about a 500-meter stretch of road. Now the network has taken over for itself. You can see that down here at the bottom of the image, this square represents the image being fed into the neural network as input. The network has basically learned to key on the position of the, of the white line and the edge of the road to determine where the road is and hence in what direction it should steer. Okay, here comes a shadow. This should be interesting. See how it, see how it deals with this. Seems to be doing okay. Yeah, things are going well. While neural networks are superficially appealing, the tasks which nets can so far conquer are a far cry from common sense. This net has to be retrained if it rains. They are every bit as small as the micro-worlds of AI, and they have a problem which conventional software doesn't. Researchers don't as yet know how nets learn. This matters because what the net may be learning may not be what the researchers think it's learning. Early neural networks contain some big surprises. They took a lot of pictures of tanks more or less hidden behind trees and trees without any tanks behind them. And they trained a connectionist net to distinguish very clearly between the set of pictures where there were tanks and the set of pictures where there weren't tanks. And it worked wonderfully. And then they went out and it, they trained it on those two sets, but they wanted to know, of course, whether it could do new ones that it hadn't seen before. Well, first they gave it further ones that they hadn't shown it from the set of tanks, and it got them. And further ones from the set of trees without tanks, and it got them. But then just to make sure, they went out and took some more pictures and gave them to the connectionist net. And it failed completely. And then the, the solution turns out to be that all the pictures with tanks in them were taken on a sunny day, and the pictures without tanks were taken on a cloudy day. And what the net had learned to discriminate was cloudy, how forests look in cloudy and sunny days. Now, no human being seeing big tanks behind some trees and not behind others would find that the similarity between the scenes was whether it was cloudy or sunny. Because 
the way we're tuned, I mean, the similarities go with the, whether the tanks are there or not. But nets, any old thing counts as similar. My cat is in love with a rat. The prospect for tiny neural networks to capture something as elaborate as common sense is a very long-term one, as connectionists are the first to admit. The nearest they have come to human speech is to get a network to learn to associate patterns of letters with their sounds when read aloud. And my sheep will not sleep. There is a way to end The network was called NetTalk. You're going to hear first what the network sounds like at the very beginning of the training. And it won't sound like words, but it'll sound like attempts that will get better and better with time. The network takes the letters, say the phrase grandmother's house, and makes a random attempt at pronouncing it. Grandmother's house. The phonetic difference between the guess and the right pronunciation is sent back through the network. Grandmother's house. By adjusting the connection strengths after each attempt, the net slowly improves. And finally, after uh, letting a train overnight, uh, the next morning, it sounds like this. Grandmother's house. I like to go to my grandmother's house. Well, because she gives us candy. Well, we Net talk no understands time. nothing Sometimes about the language. It is simply associating Sometimes letters with sounds. But at least connectionists have made a start getting neural networks to imitate some of the many things human brains do in recognizing patterns and navigating the world. Today's neural networks are very small, but attempts to make networks bigger than a few hundred neurons backfire. The training time explodes. The brain, with its 10 million neurons, has somehow managed to solve the problem. And the way it has solved it is instructive. It is not one big general purpose machine, but a collection of many special purpose machines. In the normal brain, the machines for language, vision, movement, and so on are beautifully coordinated. Somehow the brain has managed this task of integration. And from this integration emerges our general purpose intelligence and common sense. We might have to understand how nature builds and coordinates her many micro-machines before we can build an artificial version. It is a task which might take centuries to unravel. While so far AI is mostly a history of fascinating failures, there is a rich legacy of practical, specialized applications which bear its name. It has produced programs which play chess as well as all but the very best players. It has produced expert systems which can do some of the things people dreamed about in restricted domains. United Airlines flight three leaves New York. Rudimentary robots which carry trays around hospitals are starting to appear. There are computers which can read books to the blind. A signed statement can be provided by a legally qualified physician and can even translate limited amounts of Japanese into English. I have a sharp pain in my abdomen. But while these practical applications have appropriated the name artificial intelligence, they have little to do with the original quest for a general purpose intelligence based on common sense. None of them could possibly pass the test Alan Turing had proposed in 1950 and which he expected would be passed by the end of the century. None of them could use language so well they could convince us they were human. But the quest has not yet been abandoned. The project Doug Lennett began in 1984. The Psych Project is still going strong. And Lennett thinks he has a good chance of success. You can think of this as mankind's first foray into large-scale knowledge engineering. I originally put the chance of this project succeeding when we started at about 10 percent. I think even that was a little bit optimistic. I now put the chances at about two-thirds, over 60 percent. And The reason why I'm a lot more optimistic now has to do with the 
um, the ways in which we have overcome the various tar pits, the potential thorns that might have snagged us along the way. Um, there are all sorts of topics that we've had to deal with, time, space, causality, belief, emotions, um, rationality. And each one of them has had a whole community of researchers dedicating their life to formalizing, to studying, to codifying. Lennett and his team, who call themselves cyclists, are hard at work trying to capture the world piece by piece, trying to build a mind which knows enough so that it can understand language and learn. Humans, oh, humans transport it, OK. Mm -hmm. That's logical. So here is, is her house, and this is walking to her car. Syke was having some success handling ambiguous phrases. As another example, we could have something like Mary read Melville, where you can't obviously read a person, but since Melville um, wrote some novels, like Moby Dick, and since author of has high metaphor sensibility, the system knows that often you say an author's name like Shakespeare or Melville when you mean something written by them. And so down here it says probably what you meant is that uh, Mary Shepard um, was reading the Moby Dick novel. It's a profession type, and nurses are medical. Building a mind is painstaking work. What comes to mind when you think of a nurse? Sykes' mind has to be filled with all of these details of what a nurse does. Taking temperatures. Giving medicines. Now what about stressful, stress in a job? Stress in a job. I mean, nursing is very stressful. Yeah. I guess this would down here like high burnout. For Psyche to be able to understand stories about nurses, it must know about pressures on the job, and even the fact that most nurses are female. Even though Psyche runs on these computers, it has no body at all. It is just software, a pure mind. What does an entity with no body make of all the knowledge that it is fed of a world it has not directly experienced? At night, while the rest of the team are asleep in bed, Psyche looks for inconsistencies in its database and comes up with new generalizations. And it's clear that Psyche sees the world in a pretty novel way. So in the morning, we come in and see what inconsistencies ha it, it's found. And we also sometimes see what interesting new discoveries it's made. This is very interesting. I wonder if this is true. This one says that um, two countries that have um, uh, pretty much the same mixture of religions are members of pretty much the same international organizations. So I'm going to put a question mark next to that one. Uh, here's another funny skewing based on what happens to be in the knowledge base. This basically says that most people are prominent. <laughs> and that's because most of the people that we put in aside from ourselves working on the system, are uh, famous people from history. This is actually um, another, funny, another funny sort of misunderstanding, where it's been told about Fred while he was shaving in the morning. And it's reached a kind of subtle problem where, on the one hand, um, it's decided that Fred, while he's holding the razor in his hand, has some electrical parts. But on the other hand, it believes that people don't have, in general, electrical parts. <laughs> so it's trying to um, ask something here like, is Fred still a person while he's shaving? Listening to Psyche, one gets the feeling not of a developing child, but an alien intelligence who knows a lot, but has a bizarre view of the world. But what would Psyche have to achieve to convince skeptics like Dreyfus it was really intelligent? I would say if the Psych Project could understand stories of the sort that four-year-old children could understand, I'd be very impressed. I would think it had succeeded in showing that a great deal of intelligence could be captured in a totally disembodied way. Okay, great. If it fails, then I think symbolic AI is finished. It's tottering already because there's only, only that project really that seems to offer any hope. AI is finished for as many hundreds of years as it takes before we understand this mysterious thing that our brain does and how it does it. But if it succeeds, 
the potential may be breathtaking. The psych bet, even though it was a high risk bet, is a high payoff bet. And if and when it succeeds, the payoff will be in the form of passing the Turing test of general natural language understanding, of powering machine learning programs to go off and learn some things that are unknown to humanity at the present time. If you look at the psych system that we're describing as a kind of mental amplifier, um, as an intelligence amplifier, then I think you'll see that using it, you'll be able to do things in, in a few decades that today people can't dream of doing. Funding is made possible by Unisys, meeting the mission-critical information systems needs of business and government worldwide. At Unisys, we make it happen. And by the 90,000 members of the ACM, computer professionals advancing human capabilities through information technology. And the National Science Foundation.